source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. Our investigation takes place in Kingston, Ontario, a city full of history, which has a population of just over 150,000. It was once a strategic location for the maritime navigation overlooking Lake Ontario at the confluence of the St. Lawrence River and the Rideau Canal. Sunday, August 10th, 1997. The Kingston police receive a report of the disappearance of a 48-year-old woman named Yuta Weber. She has not been seen since she left work at Walmart around 10 p.m. three days earlier. The following day, Brady Marks arrives at the Kingston Police Station. She is Uta Weber's landlord and friend and has also come to report her missing. Detective Mike Campbell collects the statement from Mrs. Marks. Brady was concerned that Uta's uh, blinds had been pulled down and she couldn't see into her apartment. Brady has a uh, bake shop uh, at a uh, converted garage uh, at the back of her property and she would look out and see Yuta regularly if she wasn't at work where her uh, Yuta's GMC Jimmy would be in the driveway if she was home. And uh, she had not seen Yuta. Yuta and Brady uh, communicated almost daily and uh, Yuta's vehicle wasn't in the driveway and she usually mentioned to Brady if she was going to go anywhere or wouldn't be home, and uh, that didn't happen, and it was unusual. Brady knocked on the door, and Jim Wall opened the door, and he had been sleeping on the couch, and he didn't know where Yuta was, and was very evasive, and he didn't give any explanation where Yuta was, or when she left, or when she'd return. Jim Wall is Yuta's boyfriend and lives with her in the apartment. She had told Brady that her relationship with Wall had deteriorated. She had given him until August 15th to find another place and move out. I did police checks through uh, our computer system and realized through that investigation that uh, Jim Wall had been in prison. Of course, that made flags go up right away. And he had a history of criminal activity. In fact, he was convicted of second-degree murder in 1983, and it was on life parole. That in itself uh, gave rise to suspicion. And he was leaning more from a person of interest to a suspect in her disappearance. This information makes Mike Campbell suspect this missing person case might actually be a homicide. Kingston Police asked the Ontario Provincial Police if they could combine their resources into a joint investigation. Pat Finnegan is an OPP detective assigned to the case. He was working at Walmart. He was also driving taxi cab. If you met him, you wouldn't look at him twice. He was a very unassuming character. He could be kind of goofy and, uh, and lighthearted. Um, you certainly would never look at the man, as, as is usually the case. Um, you know, you don't walk down the street and say, oh, that, that person's a murderer. I can tell just by looking at them. Detective Mike Campbell brings Jim Wall into the Kingston Police Headquarters for an interview. Jim was uh, very evasive, didn't know where uh, Yuta was. They had taken a statement from him. Uh, it was a fairly brief statement. He didn't have a lot to say. And it focused around primarily what he did uh, the night he came home from driving cab and said that, you know, Yuta was home at that time and that uh, he believed that she was sleeping in the bedroom. So he went in and rather than wake her up, he decided to close all the blinds and go to sleep on the couch. Uh, so then Jim says, you know, he, he heard Yuta but didn't see her. So it believes that she woke up mid-morning and left. Um, and then he, he woke up around one, thought he might have gone to his mother's but wasn't sure and then again couldn't really account for the rest of his time for the next 24 hours. 
Detective Campbell interviews the owner of the taxi company where Jim Wall is a driver. He discovers that Wall did not report to work the day after Uta Weber's disappearance. Jim was scheduled to work. The owner of the taxi that he was going to, Jim was going to take the taxi over for. And he called 25 minutes before and told the taxi the owner that he couldn't work that night. And he didn't give any explanation. Something had to come up. Another person of interest for investigators is Uta Weber's ex-husband. They have been separated for several years. Dieter Heidebrecht was Uta's ex-husband. They were separated but not formally divorced. And when we looked into it, it wasn't a, as, as most marriages that separate are. Um, there's some unhappiness there that, that causes the separation. And of course, we wanted to look at that. Her ex-husband is not in Canada, but traveling in Germany. Investigators have to wait for his return to question him. Detective Campbell continues his investigation by questioning the management and staff from Walmart, who worked with Yuda the evening she went missing. She would never booked off sick. She was always to work on time and uh, was well known by the employees. And it was very unusual for her not to show up for work. There were employees that had actually seen Yuda walk to her car, get in her car, and drive out the exit of the Walmart parking lot and turn left towards the city limits as if she was going to go drive into the city. And uh, that was the last that was seen of Yuda. She didn't leave Walmart till after 10 o'clock on the 7th of August. She would have gotten home if she went directly home by 10.30. Investigators send out a press release urging the community to call in with any information. We also broadcast the, that this person was missing and if anybody having any information to the whereabouts of Uta Weber were to contact the police on a hotline number. And uh, uh, with that, we started getting tips coming in that we had to, and leads that we had to follow up. There was uh, indications that uh, Uta Weber's body was in a bay on Sydenham Lake. So we, at that point, we had to drag the lake with a uh, underwater camera. Meanwhile, police look for Uta's vehicle, which has disappeared with her. I believe uh, Uta's uh, 1986 uh, GMC Jimmy uh, was located about five blocks from her residence on the 15th of August by an, another investigator. Subsequent interviews of people in the area uh, determined that the vehicle was parked on a nearby street prior to midnight. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is going back to the time that uh, you'd have disappeared, so it would have been the 7th of August. And then the same the same people got up the next morning and noticed that it's not on this street anymore, it's, it's parked over here on College Street. So they thought it was unusual because they'd never seen it before, it wasn't from the area, didn't belong there. So it just remained sitting on College Street for a number of days. The vehicle is seized and examined by the OPP forensic unit. He applied what's known as luminol to the interior of the vehicle and luminol simply reacts with certain proteins, for example, which are found in blood. It can also react with uh, things that are chlorine-based, like Javex. But uh, some reactions were found. Investigators want to determine if these reactions could be blood. One of their experts conducts a test. In the back of Uta Weber's uh, GMC Jimmy, on the tailgate, there was a, an area of that tailgate that was actually carpeted. And I think it was a fairly significant stain. Monica Sloan, biologist and DNA expert at the Center of Forensic Science, is asked to analyze samples found during the investigation. So luminol belongs to a class of tests called presumptive tests. Uh, that when you get a positive reaction with them, it's presumed to be that it's potentially blood. And they're based on a color reaction, uh, or in the case of luminol, on the emitting of light reaction. And the hemoglobin in the blood 
contain substances that are going to cause this coloration to occur. These tests um, are often very, very sensitive. One of the reasons that police agencies use luminol and other tests like it is because of how sensitive it is. However, sensitivity is a double-edged sword. So you will get reactions with other substances that mimic that same interaction with your indicator. It's a trade-off to a certain extent, but it's still a very useful chemical for finding uh, blood when you're trying to search a large space, like a residence, like a car, and when you're looking for very, very small amounts of blood, which may be the case if there's been some indication that, that a cleanup has occurred. Luminol testing reveals that the stain found on the back of her truck is indeed blood. What really happened to Uta Weber? Will the analysis of the blood found in the back of her truck reveal a clue? At 10 p.m. on August 7, 1997, in Kingston, Ontario, Uta Weber leaves her job at Walmart. Nobody has seen her since. Her truck is found one week after her disappearance. A large stain in the back of her vehicle is found that might be human blood. Two weeks after her disappearance, investigators obtain a search warrant to conduct a thorough search of the apartment where she lives. The OPP forensic team inspects the apartment. One member of the team looks for traces of blood. He sprayed luminol throughout the apartment and he found reactions in the kitchen and bathroom. So he had positive reactions, which would lead him to believe that there had been blood there that had been cleaned up. So samples of, of that were taken. In fact, uh, pieces of the kitchen floor were, were cut up and sent into the Center of Forensic Sciences. Once identification was satisfied, uh, they, that uh, the, the evidence would not be spoiled by uh, uh, me uh, continuing my investigation by searching the, the premises itself. I uh, went in and searched uh, for belongings, for suitcases, for clothing that may not be there, anything that would show that you may have packed up and left. I had Brady Marks come into the apartment with me, and she couldn't find nothing missing. Everything uh, was in place, her wallet, her purse, all her belongings, nothing was missing. The forensic team gathers a variety of samples to be sent for analysis. There was uh, numerous things that were sent away, uh, a vacuum, um, was sent away. Uh, the computer uh, was, uh, I seized the computer and uh, subsequently had it uh, sent to Ottawa uh, to the RCMP to check the hard drive for anything that may have been wiped out or, or taken. I seized hairbrushes for possible uh, DNA of Uta Weber. At that point, we needed uh, a comparison if we did find. Uh, the blood. Investigators send the samples they collected to Monica Sloan, DNA expert at the Center of Forensic Science. The first items that were submitted in the case were was a tailgate liner from the tailgate of a GMC Jimmy vehicle, which was said to be Ms. Weber's vehicle. But on this piece of molded plastic and carpeting were several visible blood stains, as well as within the pile of the carpet were several flakes of blood that were found. What it doesn't tell us is whether that blood is human or animal, whether in this case somebody had a, you know, fish from the fishing trip on the weekend in the back of the car or the truck. The DNA profile tells Monica Sloan that the blood found on the carpet is human female blood. And that's about the only physical trait I can tell about a person from the kind of DNA profile that forensic scientists typically generate, is whether it comes from a male or female. After that, it tells me nothing about you. 
in terms of how tall you are, what color your eyes are, or whether you have any propensity for any particular disease. So once you have these unknown profiles, you need something to compare it to. And we refer to these comparison samples as reference samples. They're known samples that have been collected from an individual. They go through exactly the same process as the unknown samples do, and a DNA profile is developed in exactly the same way. And then it's a matter of comparing the two samples to see whether at each of the DNA locations, the DNA profile from the reference sample matches at all of the DNA locations from the unknown sample. In this particular case, there was a bit of a problem. The person of interest, Ms. Weber, was nowhere to be found. So we have a sort of hierarchy of samples that we like to use. First of all, obviously, a direct sample from the person. And the next sample is a, a basically a personal use sample. So taking a sample from something that that person and only that person would use on a regular basis. And that's what was done in this particular case was to use a toothbrush from Ms. Weber's house. DNA found on Uta Weber's toothbrush and on blood at the rear of the vehicle are similar. But investigators are looking for a way to verify their discovery. The next step in terms of kinds of samples we can use um, are familial samples. So for example, uh, using the parents of a person who is thought potentially to be the source of the unknown profile, or to use um, a child and the um, other parent in a particular family trio uh, to sort of try and work back the profile of the, the person of interest. So anybody in the maternal line has the same mitochondrial DNA profile. So a mother, all of her children, her mother will all share the same mitochondrial DNA profile. So if you're trying to do that kind of analysis, then you want somebody in that, that line. The police know that Mr. Heidebreck is Weber's second husband. However, she has a daughter from her first marriage who lives in Germany. I contacted uh, Yuda's daughter, Satu Mutanen, who uh, lived in Germany, and advised her that her mother was missing and uh, I would uh, need a sample of her DNA from herself and her father. Mr. Heidebrecht returns from Germany and is still a suspect in the Weber case. He provides DNA samples that will be used to determine if he was involved in his ex-wife's disappearance. I interviewed Dieter and he readily had, uh, told me about their relationship and how it ended and was very cooperative and uh, a short time later supplied all the information I had requested of him to uh, prove that he was a cooperate, that he was actually out of the country and in, in Germany when Yuta went missing. Heiderbreck is eliminated as a suspect in the disappearance of his ex-wife. The analysis of the computer seized from Yuta Weber's apartment reveals another track. When I received the analysis back from the computer, it was found that there had been a letter typed up by Uta Weber to a friend in Germany. And in that letter, the contents of that letter, she spoke of Jim Wall was stealing money from her and that she wanted to be rid of him. And uh, they were breaking up and uh, she didn't trust him. Jim Wall becomes the prime suspect. The OPP put him under 24-hour surveillance. Well, the very first thing we did was um, assign a full-time surveillance team to observe Jim Wall, follow him around and see where he went and who he met with and what he was up to. And that did yield some interesting information for us. And he met up with a fellow that we identified uh, later on as uh, Donald Gaisley, who uh, he spent a lot of time with. Uh, they went to ball game. They belonged to a ball team, and uh, they played ball together. Uh, 
and as we did surveillance on both Wall and Gacy, they seemed to be doing a lot of talking uh, and whispering and uh, sitting, talking where no one else could uh, was around. Once I realized who Donald Gaisley was and his criminal background and activities, uh, it even gave uh, a rise to more suspicion. Donald Gaisley is well known to the Kingston police. Donald Gaisley is a career criminal. He was a convicted sexual offender under investigation himself for sexual interference with uh, young children. Another detective in my department, and actually in my section, was about to arrest uh, Donald Gaisley when he disappeared, and he uh, was nowhere to be found. Surveillance of Jim Wall continues and reveals that he has begun a relationship with another woman. Through our investigation, we found out that there was a, a woman by the name of Deborah Brooks that was in the hospital. She had admitted herself for a, a breakdown. And uh, Jim Wall, being a taxi driver, had uh, picked her up to take her to a residence and chatted her up. Uh, and he knew her estranged husband, who was also a taxi driver. And they had been at a, a dance or a party together, and he had danced with Deborah Brooks at one point and once he found out from the estranged husband that she was in the hospital he went to visit her and started bringing her cigarettes and uh, starting a relationship with her in the hospital the officers noticed that jim wall and deborah brooks seem to have become very close despite the short time that they have known each other since Yuta went missing they monitor all of wall's activities in search of other evidence we followed him to a jewelry store. After he'd left, we went into the jewelry store and talked to, talk to the jeweler. Investigators find that Jim Wall picked up a ring that the jeweler had resized. At this point, police do not know if this information is relevant to their investigation. Deborah Brooks clarifies the situation. It was about one o'clock in the morning when I received a phone call at home, and I came into work and I interviewed her till about 7 o'clock in the morning. He began to tell her about his past, and included in that was the fact that he had served time for a murder. At one point, he has her down on the floor, and he, he straddles across her shoulders and has her pinned to the floor, and he's he's acting out how this, this other young man was murdered, which she found very disturbing. And at that time, the relationship became somewhat strange. She decided this wasn't somebody she really wanted to be in a relationship with. Deborah Brooks tells Detective Campbell that Jim Wall had given her a ring. Jim wanted the ring back. He kept phoning her, and she said, no, I, I don't want to see any more. The investigators discover that the ring actually belongs to Uta Weber. Uta Weber was given a ring by Jim Wall when they're beginning of their relationship. The only thing missing in her apartment was that ring. And that ring was purchased by Uta Weber with a refund that she obtained when she returned a wedding ring set that Jim had given her in May of 1997. So if you kind of connect the dots, here's, here's what Jim believes is a romance that's going to uh, conclude in marriage. He's shunned by Uta, who says, I don't want any part of this, and had remarked to friends that she didn't want any part of that. So instead of just giving him his rings back, she takes them back to Walmart, gets a refund, and buys herself a, a, you know, a cosmetic ring. The Center for Forensic Science receives a DNA profile from Uta Weber's daughter. We were able also to use the sample from Ms. Weber's daughter and from the daughter's father um, to help confirm that the donor of the profile from the um, toothbrush was could be a biological mother of this, of this child. The DNA expert concludes that the blood found in the back of Uta Weber's truck is her own. And uh, the quantity was so much that it could not be, uh, it would be unlikely that that person would survive. But investigators still have no body and no other leads. 
eventually there was a period of time where we had done everything that we felt we could do. Uh, we weren't getting anywhere and we knew that without a body it was going to be tough to lay a charge. And uh, we'd also speculated that, that one day Donald Gaisley, who appeared to be Jim Wall's best friend, and we suspected right from the get-go that he was involved and, and uh, he didn't have a very good track record for staying out of trouble. So we knew that he'd get in trouble eventually. In fact, Mike Campbell and I had talked about that. He's going to get himself in a jackpot, and then he's going to come looking for a deal. Will the intuitions of Detective Finnegan become reality, or will the disappearance of Uta Weber remain a mystery forever? Uta Weber mysteriously disappeared one night in Kingston, Ontario. Evidence leads investigators to believe they are dealing with a murder, although they do not have a body. Uta Weber's boyfriend, Jim Wall, is the prime suspect. The police closely monitor him, but do not have conclusive evidence to arrest him. After 18 months of work, investigators face an impasse and the case becomes dormant. Uta Weber's disappearance remains a mystery. Well, it's, it's almost two years later, and, and Mike gave me a call and said, you're not going to believe this, but I just got a call from a lawyer by the name of Stephen Zapp, and he's representing Don Gaisley. The Kingston police had recently charged Don Gaisley and had a warrant for his arrest for a number of sexual assault charges. And so uh, Don Gaisley was on the run, and the police were looking for him. So Gaisley knew this, and uh, through his lawyer, he was trying to cut a deal with Mike Campbell, saying, look it, I want to make sure I get bail on these charges. In exchange, I'll give you information about Jim Wall and Uta Weber. Right from the, the onset, Mike explains that the police don't make those kinds of deals, uh, that the Crown Attorney would be the only one who'd be in a position to make any sort of a deal. Well, that wasn't likely going to happen, and of course, we turned the tables by finding him first. As soon as he was arrested in Ottawa, he said, Detective Campbell, Detective Campbell, uh, I'll, I'll tell you anything. Just don't let them hurt me. <laughs> I'll tell you anything you want to know. <laughs> Donald Gaisley recounts events that point to Jim Wall's involvement in the disappearance of Uta Weber. Donald Gaisley's story to us was that uh, he had earlier, before Uta had disappeared, asked about uh, ether and what and uh, quick start and what does quick start do and quick start of course is for carburetors of the older cars where you could squirt some quick start in it and it would start the car and it it's ether donald gacy had told him that uh, ether could render someone unconscious if put over their nose and mouth for a very short time he also said that uh, Jim Wall had disposed of the uh, quick start that he had used on Utah in a dumpster just across the parking lot. So we were only relying on what he said, that he had rendered Utah unconscious and killed her. He didn't know how he killed her, and then he cut her up in a bathtub. We don't have any direct evidence of how her body was dismembered. We, we have Don Gaisley saying he cut her up in the bathtub and then put her in garbage bags. But I would have expected that bathtub to have been a, a mess, regardless of how well he cleaned it. He told us that they went out that night in uh, Uta Weber's vehicle. And his story to us was that Jim Wall called him at 9 o'clock, said, meet me at the corner of Hillendale and Princess. He didn't explain why he took a shovel and a toque and gloves, but he did say that he didn't know what was going on until he got in the vehicle, and Jim Wall told him that Uta was in the, in the back. And uh, they drove out on a dark stretch of road by a rock cut. They uh, he stopped the vehicle. Gacy realized that there was garbage bags in the back and that Uta Weber had been cut up and uh, dismembered and put into garbage bags. And he helped Jim Wall uh, carry the bags down into the swamp. Donald Gaisley claims to know where Uta Weber's body is. 
Investigators obtain a judge's order to remove Gaisley from custody so we can take them to the location where the body was dumped. For three days, so we drove up and down uh, this area of uh, Montreal Street from Kingston to Battersea. And uh, Donald Gaisley continued to be evasive and uh, it was hard to tell whether he was actually telling the truth. It's late in the day, it's about 2 o'clock or 2.30. I was getting pretty frustrated by this time. I pulled over the side of the road and I stopped the car and Donald Gacy was in the front seat beside me and Mike Campbell was in the rear seat. I said, look, um, you know, I've got things to do and a family to go home to, you don't. Um, I'm gonna go home to a nice warm fire in the fireplace and, and you're going back to the detention center where we came from. We're gonna drive this road one more time and unless your memory gets a hell of a lot better real fast, then uh, you know, we're all done playing games for the day. And so here we go. And so we started to drive. It was just dead silence. And then all of a sudden, he says, stop the car, stop the car. Something, something seems right about this. And there was a, I don't want to call it a driveway, but a, a place that you could back a car into and there was a, a steel gate there. And, and why, I don't know, because all it did was lead you into a bunch of cedars and rocks and then into a, a huge swamp. We let him walk by himself, and we, we sort of walked over and around the fallen trees and branches from the 1998 ice storm. Donald did not do that. He walked straight in a straight line down towards the swamp over broken branches and tree limbs and debris. And Donald went right straight over top of them. And when he got to a certain point, he said, Detective Campbell, uh, Detective Finnegan, I found something. I found something. I found, I think it's a garbage bag underneath all the bushes. So we kind of moved the dirt and the, the earth from around that. And, and uh, it's a garbage bag. And it's been ripped open by animals. Um, so you could kind of lift it and see inside it. And it didn't appear to have much in it other than a a bit of a yellowish substance looked like old dried up porridge actually, which I now know was adipocier, which is a form of decomposed uh, flesh or a state of decomposed flesh. So while we're looking at that, Mike Campbell calls out, Pat, I think you need to come over here. Uh, so we walked over to where he was and he points to the ground and they're just sitting right on the edge of the swamp is a skull, a perfectly intact skull. And Gaisley uh, comes in behind me and he sees this and and then he immediately just kind of drops to his knees and he starts to sob and he says, oh, that, that bastard, that bastard, he had no right to involve me in this. To this day, I'm suspicious about how much of that was uh, acting class and how much of it was sincere because I really don't think that he, he has a conscience. In my mind, it was just part of an act to distance himself as much as he could from that very horrific act of, of actually participating in, in transporting her remains to that location. Does the skull actually belong to Uta Weber? Will the garbage bag reveal evidence to prove Jim Wall murdered her? More than two years after Uta Weber's disappearance, the police receive a call from Donald Gaisley saying he knows where her remains are. Donald Gaisley is a criminal well known to police. He is hoping to have a prison sentence against him reduced in exchange for information about Weber. He leads them to a swamp where he claims that his friend Jim Wall, who was Uta Weber's boyfriend, has disposed of her corpse. The police find a skull. It is sent away for analysis to determine if it could be Uta Weber. If the results come back positive, the case will officially become a homicide. We knew that Uta had some significant dental work and had some gold fillings, and you could see the gold kind of glistening there in the, in the sunlight, and I'll never forget that. Gazy's reminding us about that shovel, you know, kind of should be right up there. That's where he threw it. We thought, well, let's take a look while we're here. So we climb up the edge of this rock cut, the three of us, and we start walking into the, we step over a fence and walk into a field, and there it is, two feet in front of us, laying there, the shovel that, that the, the grass has grown over and, and, you know, the sun is beating on, and, it looks like a shovel that's been laying there for two years. So we didn't touch anything at that point. We just 
went back, we made the calls. We needed somebody in uniform to come and transport Gaisley, take him back to jail. And, and then uh, we brought the forensics out and did as much of an examination as we could over the next two days. But we found two other rib bones during that initial search. Um, you know, the garbage bag, the skull, of course, was, was really all we needed at that point. The skull was turned over to identification unit, uh, and uh, it was subsequently sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences for testing. At that point, I found out who Uta Weber's den dentist was, and I got dental records from the dentist, and uh, they were sent off to the center and compared with the teeth in the skull. The discovery of the skull is the first breakthrough in nearly three years. Investigators hope that the bones will yield further evidence. We need to someone professionally to tell us what would have happened to the body if there was bones. What, what and that's when we enlisted the assistance of the anthropologist uh, Kathy Grusepier from Toronto. Kathy Grusepier is a forensic anthropologist who works for the Center of Forensic Science in Toronto. Forensic anthropologists um, are concerned with the study of human remains, non-visually identifiable human remains, um, that usually people assume that we look at skeletal remains. So our forte is determining um, information that otherwise wouldn't be known from human skeletal remains, um, such things as group biology, age, sex, race, stature of someone once the tissue's gone. This is quite early on in the history of forensic anthropology in Ontario, 2000, believe it or not. So in 2000, the police themselves were starting to take a closer look at what a forensic anthropologist could offer to them at the scene. And I think they were looking to me to, to identify the bones at the scene for them because we're in an environment where there could be a lot of animal bones as well. Unfortunately, the investigators need to wait until after the spring thaw to continue their search of the swamp. So it's very difficult to leave what you know is a crime scene with no way to secure it and to leave it unattended for several months and just let nature do its thing. But in this particular case, we didn't have a choice. The Center of Forensic Science confirms that Uta Weber's dental records match the skull. Investigators finally have enough evidence to arrest their prime suspect. Arrested Jim Wall on the 13th of January, 2000, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we walked up to the car and opened the driver's door and, and, uh, and asked him to get out. And, and we said, Jim Wall, you're under arrest for the first degree murder of Uta Weber. Investigators ask Kathy Grusepier to analyze the skull and rib fragments to ensure that all the samples are from the same person. I just did a, an anthropological analysis determining her age as best as I could with what I had, um, her, her race and um, her sex. Most normally with a skeleton, I'll find a range of trauma, um, which will consist of, as I said before, anti-mortem, what we call before death, trauma or disease. And we can tell that that happened before the person died because there's signs of healing. Um, then there's also, particularly with skeletons that have been in the outdoor environment, post-mortem damage from animals. This is quite a common occurrence. Investigators now have a skull and rib fragments that belong to Uta Weber, but they still don't know how she died. Will the waters of the swamp reveal any clues to her cause of death? Two years after Uta Weber was reported missing, investigators have a positive identification of her remains. They eagerly await the spring thaw to continue their investigation of the swamp where her skull was found. Uta Weber's boyfriend, Jim Wall, has been arrested and charged with her murder. I didn't know how deep the swamp was until I got there. Essentially, they were doing shoulder to shoulder search through the swamp and just bending down and pulling things up. Not an ideal way to do a search. Essentially, you're working blind in the water. You are with nothing but your hands, and it's cold water in April. The water in the swamp is murky and prevents them from doing a thorough search. The team examines dry land until they can find a solution. 
I said go for the dry. I mean, an animal's not going to eat in the water. And all the bones we found were in dry, high dry spots. Now I know that coyotes and probably some wolves as well um, can tend to drag things off up to over a kilometer away. The only bones that were found the first day were on those little dry mounds. So we, I think we got um, all of the bones of the right arm, the scapula, humerus, and lower right arm bones the first day, and that got everybody very excited. We realized, though, that we had to have find some way of dealing with getting rid of the water because you just you can't do a search. You can't see through. You know, putting your hands in is just churning things up. The search has been ongoing for two days. To ensure they don't leave any evidence behind, investigators decide to remove a beaver dam to drain the murky waters of the swamp. So we did a final search, and I walked out into the swamp and went on the first hillock and found the proximal right femur, which had four cut marks in it. After three days, the search of the swamp is complete. Kathy Grusbeer must now analyze the bones that were found. We had skull, and we had two fragmentary ribs, the right shoulder blade, the right upper arm bone, the right lower two arm bones, the left shoulder blade, and just the top end of the right thigh bone. Um, all of the bones showed some evidence of carnivore scavenging, I'd call it. Um, and I think that it was, it was a small carnivore, so we weren't really dealing with coyote. Could have been a farmer's dog, um, but you can usually see the, the tooth punctures from the canine teeth of these animals, and they were smaller, so I think I suggested something like a fox, perhaps. The fragment of the right femur shows signs of dismemberment and fracture. When I do these dismemberment analyses, I do measurements and casts and look under the microscope, um, characterize what I can see, and from characterizing these cuts, I could tell that they were caused, number one, by a saw as opposed to a straight blade. Um, the type of cuts and the repositioning of the saw on the saw face, on the face, the cut face, told me that it was a handheld saw. The false start curves uh, I measured at 1.1 millimeter, so that means that the blade was thinner than that, but most saw blades are. And, um, there was some bendings, which suggested to me that perhaps it was a, a, a bit of a flimsy blade. I gave a couple of examples of what types of saw could have a thin blade like that and be somewhat flexible. Uh, and I suggested that something like a hacksaw, but I can't, could not say for sure that it was a hacksaw. We didn't have a cause of death, as you know. Uh, however, the one piece of bone that we had that was dismembered and had cut marks directly through it was from the top of the thigh. I'm not a pathologist, so I can't say the cause of death in this case, but if you cut someone's leg off through their thigh, the femoral artery is cut and they couldn't survive. We can't say whether she was alive or whether she was dead at the time that that cut was made. The femur is in poor condition, so it is sent to the United States for mitochondrial DNA analysis. It is important for the investigators to confirm the femur also belongs to Yuta Weber because the saw marks found on it will prove she was dismembered. Defense counsel at the time were going to refuse to accept, uh, you know, as an agreed statement of fact that that femur belonged to Yuta Weber. Yeah, okay, you've got her, you've got her skull. We're going to have to live with the dental X-rays, but who's to say that's not from someone else's body? And that was the game that they were playing. The fact that we had no direct evidence leaking. Uh, Jim Wall to the actual murder. The, they tried to uh, form a different scenario to the jury that it was Donald Gaisley that actually committed the murder and Jim Wall was an innocent bystander that just sort of helped out. And it was Donald Gaisley that could have come to Yuta's apartment and murdered her that night. Because Jim was his friend, he helped him out. Jim Wall never said a word through the whole six-week trial. So not once uh, in my life have I ever heard that man say, I didn't do it. I didn't kill you to ever. The trial ended when the jury came back and returned a, a verdict of guilty for first-degree murder of you to Weber. And Jim was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. 
Jim Wall is put in prison for the brutal murder of Uta Weber. He takes with him the secrets of what really happened on the night of August 7th, 1997. The stagnant waters of the swamp could have been the perfect accomplice to a murderer. But the animals that live in the area and the persistent investigators force the water to reveal its deepest secrets.